Welcome back, everyone. We're here with another Q&A. Anything that I say is not meant to diagnose or cure you. Check with your doctor before implementing any of the stuff that we're going to talk about. We have a great lineup of people to, to ask questions. And if you're on social media, definitely write your questions in. We're going to try to today pull off a miracle and get to every single person. Absolutely. And we have some highly intelligent people in the green room ready to talk to us about their various foibles or success stories or whatever. And uh, also, we have uh, the usual quiz questions. And I must warn the audience, there are no true falsers, which would allow you to flip a coin and be smart or dumb, respectively. In this case, you're going to have to use every cognitive uh, talent you have. But they're interesting questions. So we should all know the answer to these. And Doc, here's the first one. All right. So first one is, which sugar is worse than high fructose corn syrup? Thanks for... You actually, I could ask it even better. Which one is more deadly? Ouch. So that's the first question. Okay, you'll certainly want to know that one. Okay, why don't we also just kick it off? We love the fact that not only uh, the three folks that happen to be in the United States that are going to come on and, and ask you a question, but also the people all around the world. So we'd like to say a good morning to all of our viewers joining us today from the UK, Canada, Mexico, Pakistan, Ireland, Singapore, Armenia, Hong Kong, Aruba, United Arab Emirates, Algeria, Jamaica, Cameroon, Malaysia, Slovakia, Uganda, Wales, Cyprus, Scotland, and Lebanon, Denmark, Bangladesh, Eritrea, Turkey, Spain, Uzbekistan, Portugal, Austria, Sweden, Oman, New Zealand, Germany, Lithuania, Jordan, Barbados, the Virgin Islands, Chile, Trinidad and Tobago, South Africa, France, India, Nepal, wow, Nigeria, Egypt, Russia, Emeritus, if I said that right, Terry, the Philippines, the Czech Republic, the Netherlands, Australia, Taiwan, Iran, uh, Italy, Belgium, Ethiopia, Norway, Poland, almost on audience, Ghana, uh, Peru, Saudi Arabia, Finland, and all across these United States of America. So welcome, everyone. And don't want to put the people in the green room under pressure, but they're all looking for high entertainment from all three of you. So stand ready uh, to uh, be a big part of the show. All right, speaking of social media, uh, what? Uh, let's start off with social media. Juan from Facebook, what are your recommendations to treat vertigo? It can be a couple different causes to that. Um, one would be a sinus infection where there's mucus that builds up in the eustachian tube and then back gets in the back of the ear. And so if, if that's the problem, it could be some seasonal allergy. And if that's the case, Spanish black radish is the best... Uh, Thing to take for that it tends to pull mucus from the deep deep areas of your body you can even get it as a supplement uh, another uh, problem with this uh, is the broken up little calcium deposits that form uh, in the inner ear and then they can circulate around and uh, irritate the hairs of the ear and make it feel like you're just like always dizzy and things like that um and so in that case, there's a the video I did on a test that you can go through to see if you have that. And it, it kind of helps you figure out which ear that you have this problem with. And one of the good remedies for that is vitamin K2. It helps to um, kind of transport, um, you know, calcium in different places in the body. So that would be a good remedy. There's other remedies as well. But um, and then there's a, there's a couple other things to look at as well. But those are the top two most common issues. Okay, very good. And audience, he mentioned videos. And here's another way to get hold of them. The free Dr. Berg app is available on both uh, um, Android and Apple. So grab hold of that and you will have all the information you need in your pocket anytime you wish. It's also very organized, as I understand, right, Dr. Berg? So if they query from something there, it's a lot easier to find often than on YouTube. I'm having a hard time finding my, uh, my own videos on YouTube. So uh, yeah, there's definitely a search engine problem right now. So we're working on that. All right, very good. Okay, I, Inez from YouTube as well. Can fermented vegetables work the same as apple cider vinegar with water? Well, I think they work a little different because um, when you're doing uh, apple cider vinegar, you're doing acetic acid. And uh, when you're doing fermented vegetables, you're doing more lactic acid. You can get lactic acid from kombucha tea and that has a different effect than acetic acid, but there are two byproducts that your body actually can make naturally as well. So um, uh, I think uh, the benefit of the fermented vegetables 
are huge because you get a probiotic, prebiotic, and you get um, you get the benefit of um, helping your immune system and helping your gut flora. Um, and then the acetic uh, acid from apple cider vinegar is great for blood sugars. It can give you energy. It can indirectly help you with insulin resistance, which is behind so many problems out there, including a fatty liver. Wow. Okay. Well, as, as usual, there's a few uh, holdouts that want to be uh, acknowledged this morning, and they are joining us from Thailand, Israel, Dubai, Japan, Romania, and Morocco. I can't imagine we've m uh, missed too many countries. So that's uh, absolutely terrific. All right. On with more from our social media folks. Mystic Melody from YouTube. When you are doing a prolonged fast, is it okay to drink broth from boiled seasoned vegetables or will it take you out of the autophagy? You know, it's not a bad idea if you're doing broth because you could, that's a good way to get your salts, your sea salt, if you add a good amount of seed off salt in there. And there's not a lot of calories in vegetable broth. So, um, I mean, I think it's going to be totally okay. Um, but when you get into more calorie type foods, that's when you break the fast. Wow. Well, Melody, I thought he might yell at you, but he didn't. He's going to let you drink for all. Now, one more, one more point about the, um, they have the bouillon, what do you call those? Uh, bouillon? Bouillon cubes. Yeah. Those little cubes that uh, you buy to, as a stock for soups and things, read the labels on those. Cause they're filled with monosodium glutamate, maltodextrin. Uh, unfortunately, it's hard to find one without that. And um, hopefully someone will come up with one without, without that. I will definitely promote it and use it myself. All right. Let's give some uh, counsel to Kimberly from YouTube. How much berberine should I take on a daily basis? I'm 190 currently and 5'7". Thank you, she says. I think you just should take the normal dose that they recommend because it's it's um, more is not always better with that herb, but it'll have a really cool effect of uh, helping you with insulin resistance. I just released a video today on berberine and it's like a, it's like a natural version of metformin and people are taking metformin for not just blood sugar issues, but for uh, a lot of other problems, which have, has a side effect, lactic acidosis. So um, it also depletes your B1 vitamin as well as B12. So you have to be careful with that, but berberine doesn't. All right, very good. Why don't we go to our green room? Uh, speak of the devil. Look at this, this is terrible. Poor Marnie. Now she doesn't look green normally, but I just so you, there's something you definitely need to give her some counsel because there's something going on. But uh, in deference to you, Marnie, I'm going to take your picture down because it looks funny. And why don't you go ahead as a phone call and ask yes. Dr. Berg your question? Go ahead, Marnie. Oh, my question. Hello, everybody. Uh, so my question was, actually, I started based on your information, Dr. Berg, I started to do intermediate fasting, mm -hmm. and um, I love it. So I would like to know, in order to have keto diet and intermediate fasting, how can it be possible to build the muscle? What's the best way to build the muscle? And what type of nutrition, uh, in that case, it's good to use? Supplements, I meant. You know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things you can try, but to like creatine phosphate is a supplement. Your body actually makes creatine, um, and that does have an effect on muscle um, and energy. Um, you can actually, it gives you more ATP, uh, so that's one thing you could try while you're doing weight training. But what stimulates the actual muscle growth itself is um, some exercise with, with, with weights, resistant training, versus anything else, uh, that's how you're going to build muscle. Now, recently, um, um, you know, I switched my exercise routine, and I'm going to talk about that more in some of the other questions. So I'm not going to, as I'm talking about, I'm not going to say anything yet, because I'm realizing that's one of the questions. But the point is that um, you need to activate the muscle. Uh, so while you're fasting to build muscle, because if you're, if you're just not active, you're not going to build the muscle, regardless of how much protein you eat, um, but building muscle is not just eating more protein. You have to activate it with exercise. That's the biggest stimulus. But this creatine phosphate can actually help you a little bit with, um, it might indirectly help muscle um, fibers, but it does also increase glycogen storage. And with that comes water. So your muscles will look fuller, 
more hydrated. It's not a bad thing. Um, they'll look bigger, but we're, I know you want to probably make them actually bigger. So that can help as well. And how much milligram of creatine is good for the year? Approximately. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's like three to five grams um, per day okay. help you in your workout um, to give you the unfair advantage. So um, yeah, that's uh, something you can add to your, your weight training. Okay. All right, Marini. Well, listen. My question. All right. Thank you, Marini. Listen. Yes. Thank uh, you. Okay. Get back with us and let us know if you get all buff and stuff. That's what we're looking for and hoping for you. All right, folks. And the first quiz question of the day was answered. And it asked, bring that up, which sugar is worse than high fructose corn syrup? And the audience, and I hope they're right, at least 80% of them say it is one of the many artificial sweeteners, such as erythritol. And then the last 20% say it's maltodextrin. What do you think, Doc? Okay, so, so this question is very specific to just sugar. Um, but you're right, maltodextrin acts like a sugar, even though it's, they have a look. Stand by audience. While we're waiting for the doctor to come back, I'm going to entertain you once again to remind you all to get the wonderful uh, free download. And um, that will allow you to watch Dr. Berg even when he's frozen on screen like he appears to be currently. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to just put us on pause for a moment until we get the good doctor back. Please stand by. Dr. Berg, I'm sorry, uh, oh, your audio is not coming through yet. Audience, again, we will work on this and get right back with you. Um, I tell you what, folks, we need, a, we 
may need to kind of restart this software, Dr. Berg. I'm really sorry, but I'm afraid that's what we're going to have to do. So guests, audience, everyone stand by, and we'll be back. Stand by. We're coming back. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Okay, that's all right. And... All right, audience, forgive our uh, terrible glitch there, but we're back with uh, Dr. Berg and the cast. I think we wrapped up that one quiz question. And uh, Dr. no, I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer the question because I didn't really get the answer to the question. Right. So, um, the worst sugar, worse than high fructose corn syrup, is you ready for this? Agave nectar. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, most sugars, like beet sugar, like table sugar. I purchased corn syrup are roughly about a 50 50 split between glucose and fructose and fructose apparently does not necessarily work uh, like glucose. It doesn't necessarily spike your blood sugars or affect insulin too much directly, but indirectly it does, but directly it, uh, the liver takes the load as compared to glucose, you know, can be uh, metabolized by all of your cells. So when you consume, um, agave nectar you're you're dealing with like 85 percent fructose and only 15 percent glucose and that's a tremendous burden on the liver because the liver treats glucose like alcohol so it's considered a toxin so you say well i thought agave was natural yeah but agave nectar is not natural <laughs> and so it puts a tremendous amount of fructose into your body and you think it's well low in the glycemic index but you're just basically creating a fatty liver and um probably eventually a scarred liver. There's probably not going to be a lot of research in this area, but just from the basic principle of understanding fructose, it's the worst sugar um, that you could eat. Wow. Okay. Back to or social. Drink. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's go back to in this time, Facebook, Deborah, my aunt just told me she has end stage kidney failure. Is there any way keto and or IF could help her reverse this? Um, horrible disease Please if, you're, help. if you're in stage um you have to really work with the doc to, because there's certain f nutrients that you have to be careful of having too much like phosphate and, and potassium and these other nutrients so you have to work with uh, a doc but on the same token i would actually keep your carbs low and as the kidney improves because think about the number one cause of kidney damage it's diabetes uh what's diabetes high sugar in the diet and I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the blood, blood level. So if you were to um, start improving that and then maybe go from a end stage liver disease to a stage four to stage three, and you start improving the kidney function, then maybe you can add more of these um, other things, nutrients that you, your body can handle. So yeah, you can do a version of the keto, but you just have to work with the doc uh, to make sure you're not taking too much of certain nutrients. But I, if I had end stage kidney problem, that's what exactly what I would do. I would not, um, you know, do the diet that they're just recommending just the worst foods possible. Wow. Well, Deborah, we're pulling for your aunt. I hope she can improve from that um, critical condition. All right, let's go back to our questions. And here's the next one, Doc, for the audience. Another no true false. All right. So is fructose lowering? If fructose is low, low on the glycemic index, there's a typo there. Why is it so bad for us? All right, folks. I may have just answered that in the last question, but let's just see how many people were listening. Very well. Who can blame them? They got an excuse. We botched the show right in the middle, so we'll see how loyal they are. So get on that, folks, uh, and give us a nice answer. And let's go back to, uh, let's see, social media. Okay, we already did that one, and Terry's catching up with me. Hang on, I'll find one for us. We did the berberine. Okay, Tracy from YouTube, what advice would you share with someone who's pregnant while on OMAD? I would probably add another meal in there or two because, you, you know, it's just always the factor of like, are you getting enough nutrients from the calories? Are you getting enough energy? What, you know, it's not the best time to do the OMAD one meal a day while you're pregnant because you're, you're feeding two for two. So... I think it's the most important to eat healthy. I would definitely wouldn't do the snacking, but I would definitely probably have probably three meals and, uh, and eat super like healthy version of keto. And that way that child comes out 
uh, has the best chance of being super healthy. Now, the other factor I want to recommend is definitely do breastfeeding because you're going to find the immune system of that child is going to be better. Chances are of them having allergies are going to be a lot smaller than if they weren't breastfed. So the most crucial time is to make sure you have a natural prenatal, make sure you do super healthy foods. But so many women, unfortunately, don't have that data. And they, um, the kids come out having more issues than, than not. So that's, that's my advice. All right, very good. Dean from YouTube, I have a cyst on my kidney. I have been eating only organic foods. It was first diagnosed last August and have not been able to gain weight since then. Help. Well, Dean, if you need help gaining weight, just come to my house. What do you think, Doc? I, the cysts are, um, are a bit of an unknown. You know, people don't uh, really know what causes them. <clears throat> so they're benign. Uh, most of them don't grow or do anything. They just sit there. I think, I think the purpose of them is just to encapsulate some type of toxicity. And so the answer is to just go more organic and eat less toxicity and go on the ketogenic diet. Uh, I don't, I know that cysts will grow on the body, especially like Baker cysts or other cysts. If the person's doing a lot of carbs, um, or drinking wine is it will do it as well. Uh, so what I would do um, is I would um, just stick on keto and I don't think the cysts are interfering with your weight gain or weight loss. Um, but um, anything related to kidney, uh, you do want to do healthy keto for sure. All right. Very good. Well, the audience is jumping on these questions fast. Our last one asked if fructose is lower on the glycemic index, why is it bad for you? And uh, the audience, uh, well, 100% of our respondents say it's bad news for, ta-da, drum roll, the liver. Yeah, so I, I, of course, gave you that answer from the previous question. So that that's a very good thing that most people are listening, or actually everyone's listening 100%. It's wonderful. But I want to say something about the fructose, uh, because the fructose is dealt with uh, the body differently. The liver takes it. It, um, you know, the amount of, it's the quantity too. Like, think about what people are doing. They're drinking their fructose especially even high fructose corn syrup, and that fructose um, that's so refined, it doesn't have all the antioxidants that fruit does. So like as a food, you're just drinking pure fructose. It's uh, from the evolutionary point of view, it, um, it's meant to consume or deal with uh, seasonal type, maybe honey or fruit. But back way back in the day, we didn't eat that quantity that we eat now, right? Which is available 24 seven in the, in the, the amount of it. So uh, it has an interesting effect on the liver to help, uh, help you store fat quicker for the winter months, uh, even generate um, uric acid to, as an antioxidant. So um, it's it, the, the quantities are just killing us uh, right now. It's like uh, going to the liver will make that liver very fatty. Uh, so, the next time you go get the big gulp, the sodas, just remember what I said about that. It's just a high fructose corn syrup. Probably stay away from that. All right. You've heard it, audience. JK from YouTube. Can L-arginine help with increasing height? I assume that JK is in his growth years. Can help what? Uh, increase increase what? his Growth's height, on? I guess. Make him grow taller. Oh, um, I, I don't I don't know. I, I think that... Um, you know, it does increase growth hormone. That's for sure. I don't know if that's going to be the thing that's going to do it for you. Um, there's other things that can increase growth hormone, which I'm going to talk about later in the show after I, we answer all the questions. But growth hormone, um, you can if you're growing and you're not past the age of 18 or 20, um, a, a really interesting product that I used in practice was something called the Tuotrophin PMG, you can get it from a company called Standard Process. I'm not affiliated with that company, but um, the Tuotrophin supports the pituitary. And I, I swear, like when I would put children that should be taller on that, um, I noticed they started growing a lot faster. Not guaranteeing it, but it's something to look at um, to try out. All right. Very good. Uh, L from YouTube. How can I lower my A and C of 6.1? I eat very well and exercise daily. I do have a family history of diabetes. And by the way, doc, from, for my knowledge and the audience, 
uh, I hear those numbers all the time. What's good? What's a good A and C number? What's a baseline? A A one C is basically the amount of <clears throat> accumulated glucose that's stuck to your blood cells, like the hemoglobin. That's a really good uh, one of the best indicators for um, to see if someone's cheating or not, because it gives you an average of blood sugars for the whole three months. So if you're cheating on the weekends, it'll come out average. It's a little bit higher. So we want it below 5.7, but even lower than that. But 5.7 is kind of the borderline. As you go higher, uh, you become a pre-diabetic. And then a 6.4 is an actual diabetic. So, and it just tells you where the blood sugars are. Um, we want the blood sugars below 100, like, like maybe 80, something like that. But I mean, a lot of people have A1C like in the fours, 4.5, things like that. And that means their blood sugars are like, like low 70s, even 60s. Uh, you might think that's hypoglycemia, but if you're not eating sugar, your blood sugars will go low and you'll feel fine because you're not adding the sugar. But here's the thing. If you are a diabetic or uh, you have a pre-diabetic, um, you pretty much lost 50% of your beta cells. That Those are the cells in the pancreas that make insulin, which means you have less insulin to deal with, which means you have less ability to push the blood sugars down. So even though you start the ketogenic diet and you come off sugars, it might take longer for you to bring your sugars down because of the fact you just don't have the insulin any, um, like you did before. What you need to do is just add those other things like the apple cider vinegar, the berberine, be real strict and just give it more time because it will happen if you do it. It might take weeks or months, but just hang in there, um, add exercise as well, and um, eventually it'll all come down, come out in the wash. But um, it's just that uh, that's really why your blood sugars are higher and it's hard to bring them down. And then of course that relates to A1C because it, you're measuring an average of blood sugars for the whole three months. All right, L, it sounds like you're on the right path. Uh, you know, keep exercising and eat very well. Maybe you need to examine that. Uh, and Dr. Burke has a million uh, videos to help guide you in that regard. Okay. Anna from YouTube, which diet would be best for a young child? Should they follow the healthy keto and IF diet at an early age? I can anticipate your answer. <laughs> It really depends. Uh, definitely healthy keto for sure. But fasting, it really, you know, <laughs> if you're seven years old and you're watching this right now, uh, you probably don't need to do intermittent fasting. But I will say, um, if if kids would just have three meals a day and not all the snacks, that would be a good thing. Because I think uh, even if we compare myself when I was a kid and even Steve, when you were a kid, you probably didn't snack as much as they do now everything is snack 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 bring food everywhere you go it's just it's all pushed by the uh, snack industry uh in fact this might be shocking steve but there if you go to the grocery store there's entire aisles of snacks for sale did you know that well um unfortunately i've fallen victim to that a few times even with my <laughs> immense discipline sometimes my feet screech to a halt in uh in such a spot yeah, so um, do the three meals, and then let's say a child is uh, 11 or 12 years old and there's obesity. Well, then maybe just do two meals a day, but make sure it's sufficient calories. All right, audience, mm -hmm. stand by. You're coming in and out, Doc. There we go. I think we've got you back. Okay. So Go we ahead. lost about the last five seconds. But anyway, um, so, you know, Doc, you mentioned, um, you know, my youth, and I'm almost 70 years old. So in the 60s, you, if you saw a person overweight, it was like a spectacle. Now, we didn't eat all that well, but maybe the exercise also makes a difference. You know, we had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on Wonder Bread for lunch, but then we ran all day long and fell around and maybe have a, a Kool-Aid ice cube, which is probably the worst thing in the world, filled with sugar. But no one was overweight, so it really is interesting. We're, you know, all stuck in front of an iPad and so on, but, you know, we used to run all day long, and we never saw anyone that was overweight. Again, it was sort of a spectacle if you saw a big person walking around. I think there's three things. The, the biggest change would be the fructose, introduction of fructose. That's big in the high fructose corn syrup. 
I'll also you have the snacking is probably might be even bigger, more snacking. We implemented that. I remember we didn't have that as much. And then um, also then the omega six fatty acids, the oils, all the oils have replaced the saturated fats, which is another factor. So I think those three factors, and like you said, uh, exercise is another factor, but yeah, those are big changes. Um, all right, very good. Well, absolutely. let's go boy, uh, excuse me, girl, boy, girl. So we're going to bring Aaron in next. And Aaron is um, joining us from Dallas, Texas, where he says it's very humid and hot right now. And Aaron, if you're unmuted, you're on with Dr. Berg. Hey, Dr. Berg. Hi. Hey, um, so, I so I started, started taking the top ring shots, the, the, the fogginess, fogginess and, and cognitive, cognitive decline, decline, lack of energy, energy et cetera. And so, so my, my question, question for you is, is how can, can I use keto, keto or are there any specific tips you can give to keep, keep the, the hypogonadism hypo in the way when, when I, I get off this top run completely? Yeah, I think there is. Um, one of the biggest things you have to realize also testosterone follows the biochemistry of growth hormone. They both kind of work in a similar fashion. Uh, the top of the list is zinc. Make sure you're taking enough zinc and eating foods high in zinc, like shellfish, especially oysters are the best and even red meat. So the zinc will help you greatly. And then of course the, um, the intense exercise is another thing that can help you with that as well. You have to be careful about estrogen being too high in men. Um, and believe it or not, uh, not that you, you do this, but there's something called um, alcohol, wine and beer and things like that, that will increase your estrogen and shut down the testosterone. Um, so to overcome this uh, aging related lowered testosterone, you have exercise, zinc, make sure it's intense exercise. And then also um, the cold bath, the cold immersion, believe it or not, uh, has some great research on increasing testosterone uh, as a hermetic or a epigenetic stimulus of that. Uh, so that's another thing, jump in the cold cold shower or bath that, to, to, to raise that those levels, I think. Uh, and then fasting. Fasting is another thing that will increase testosterone, believe it or not. Uh, Prolonged, periodic, prolonged, and regular intermittent fasting. All right. All right thank thank you. you. Hey, you're welcome. You know, keep us posted. That's really fascinating, uh, Aaron. Uh, you know, um, I've heard lately that men's and women's testosterone is a lot lower than it used to be because of things in the environment, uh, phthalates and plastic and so on. So who knows where we're all going. Again, a lot different than when we were little kids, huh, Doc? Slightly. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, why don't we go to the question number three for the day. And Doc, here it is. Okay, so I gotta pull this one up here. Okay, so what is the primary reason a diabetic uh, has a problem lowering blood sugars after getting off carbs? Now, what's interesting is people are asking questions that are kind of crossing over to some of these questions. So let's see who's paying attention and See if they can get that answer. You're, we're looking for a hundred percent audience. You had the tip. Okay, let's see. TV in Texas from YouTube. What would be the best substitute for Adderall in a fifty-five-year-old with true ADHD? Yeah, I would highly recommend. You know, in addition to the healthy keto and intermittent fasting, to get on a natural form of the B complex. Okay, B complex. It'll feed the neurons. It'll feed the brain. Um, uh, don't use the synthetic and then use higher amounts um, of this B1. Um, I think that would be a great, great program. And you probably see miraculous results for attention uh, to increase your focus and your attention. Um, it might be a transition when you phase off the medication, but uh, keep working with your doctor to do that. Um, because the problem is every time you do it, it's harder to come off of it. Your body gets a little bit weakened and used to it. So it's going to be a time transition phase. You can't just do a cold turkey, but, but work with your doc to do that. And hopefully you can come off that. It's like, you know, even some of the psych drugs, um, they put you on this, but is there any a plan? Is there a plan to come off of it? And how do you come off of it? And what do you replace it? Is there any, I mean, some docs don't even think you're ever going to come off of it. Like, is this a permanent thing? And there's side effects and there's complications. And also, the more you use it, 
the more it doesn't work. So you need more amounts of it. So it's really um, not a long-term solution or if, even if a short one. Well, speaking of testosterone, Marta from YouTube, what would you recommend besides IFN, uh, IF for a 41 year old woman with high testosterone levels? I'm not postmenopausal. That's interesting. Well, um, testosterone is a form of androgens and there's a couple things that can increase androgen too in an unhealthy way for women. And the biggest one is um, insulin. So there could be something increasing the insulin. So you want to go on low, low carb, do intermittent fasting. But there's also another remedy for um, high androgens in, in women that have polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is inositol. Inositol is a really good remedy to help regulate that. And it just so happens to be kind of a, it's a type of B vitamin that is even sweet. It's like when you, you can suck on it, it's like eating candy, but it's, there's no sugar in it. It's interesting. All right, very good. Well, I'm very relieved to hear from Spam Mouse from YouTube, who has the theory that Dr. Berg's goats are eating his internet connection. And I appreciate that, Spam Mouse, because that takes the pressure off of me. Certainly can't be my production setup here. So, Dr. Berg, everyone forgives you and your goats for botching up the, um, the feed earlier. Well, and I'm completely absolved. I, I, will say, I will say something about goats. Out of all the animals, different animals we have, boy, those goats, I'm, I swear they... It could be a sitcom. They can get in. They have personalities. They get into everything. No matter what you do, you can't conceal them in a paddock. They'll find a way to get out no matter what. And uh, I keep building bigger barriers to the point where they somehow got through it. So Now, how about your pet goat? We haven't them. heard from him in about a year. Billy, is it? What, where's, what's Billy doing? Yes, Billy. Billy is uh, one of the goats uh, that Karen uh, bottle fed. Um, and... And he's the kind of the leader of the pack. So, uh, yeah, they're uh, they're an interesting clan. All right, very Motley good. Crew. Well, again, thanks for saving me on that spam mouse. Really appreciate it. Let's see, Linda from YouTube. I have recurring mono, and I seem to catch colds and virus very easily. How can I boost my immune system? Uh, I feel myself getting more tired and weak over time. Sorry to hear that, Linda. Yeah, the mono is a. Uh, Usually the Epstein-Barr virus, it can go, it's a latent virus, it can go in and out of remission, um, mainly triggered by stress, emotional stress. So that is something you have to hyper-focus on and do whatever you can to improve that stress and do things to re release the stress, including physical work around the house, long walks. Um, you know, I have a lot of videos on that, but um, you can also take things like zinc and vitamin D but it's usually some type of uh, stress, stress situation that activates or brings it out of remission. Um, and so that's, that's the area that I would put your attention on. All right, very good. Okay, Asian, calling themselves that, Asian from YouTube, is the high-fat keto diet acceptable for someone with no gallbladder? There's a few of those. Yeah, yeah, because guess what? Your your body still makes uh, bile. It's just not stored and concentrated. So uh, some people are do just quite fine. But let's say your stool uh, becomes light colored or it starts to float or you notice your eyes at night, you're driving, you can't quite see as well. That's a lack of vitamin A. It means you need more bile. So just add a little bile salts after the meal and that will solve that problem. But um if you have too much bile, you'll get diarrhea. So that's another way to know you have too much. So, All right, very good. Well, the audience didn't answer this with 100%. And the question asked, what is the primary reason a diabetic has a problem lowering blood sugars after getting off of carbs? And let's see the split in the audience. 65% of the respondents say it's because it takes time for the insulin to be restored to a normal level. 20% say it's because all of the stored sugars in the body, like glycogen, uh, and 15%, there's less insulin in the pancreas to, pr to process the sugars. Three answers. <clears throat> well, you, you know, um, most people got it right because it's, like I said before, you're only producing, you only have like 50% of the beta cells that make insulin. So now, because the, the pancreas is damaged. So you, you're not, you don't have enough insulin anymore. And on top of that, you have insulin resistance. So uh, because it's been working so hard, it's exhausted. So now we don't have that that push down blood sugar push down uh, force anymore like we did before. And so if you're diabetic, it takes longer to reestablish these blood sugars. 
the thing to do is know that don't give up and give it more time. So, um, more fasting will help you and uh, you'll see it'll eventually over the course of weeks or months, it'll, it'll come down. All right. Very good. Well, before the goats get to the wire again, we should get Georgina on and she's from Baton Rouge and Gina, you are on with Dr. Berg with your one question in 30 seconds. Go. All right. Hi, Dr. Berg. I have Hello. been on your plan since February. Um, doing great. Resolved many issues so far, but there is one that no one seems to be able to help me with. Um, I have suffered from lifelong hormonal migraines that come around the time of my cycle, um, accompanied with extreme hunger, and nothing seems to help. Um, I've tried the sodium like you recommended, um, and it's like a, a speeding train. I, I can't stop it. I don't, know you, um, I, want, I don't want to rely on the pharmaceutical medications anymore. Do you have any suggestions? Did you say it's related to your cycle, right? Yes, it's a week before or the day of, and it, it comes in threes. So I have three days of full-blown migraines. There's, I can't seem to... Um, I can't seem to fix that issue. I, I've suffered with the hypoglycemia, with the hunger, headaches, and the keto has helped that. And I thought it would help with this hormonal issue, but I can't seem to stop it. Like, for example, I woke up with one at 4 o'clock this morning today. I had to take a pill. <clears throat> and I'm not hungry. I'm fasting 23 hours a day, except when my cycle's coming, I can't stop the hunger. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. That's terrible. I could only imagine. That's uh, very irritating. <laughs> There's a couple tips. Uh, it's definitely um, related to a shift in estrogen, what estrogen does. There's a couple of things that I would try right off the bat. Um, I have, there's been some success with doing um, turmeric, like uh, maybe a couple of days before your period and really getting that turmeric in the body. It has uh, some cool properties to help hormonal flows. Okay. The other remedy would be milk thistle for your liver uh, because there's a, there's a hormone, there's a, it was a protein that helps you buffer uh, fluctuations in estrogen and you might, you might need that help. And uh, milk thistle is one of the best uh, protective herbs against so many things in the liver. So it basically protects the liver against poisons and uh, it also helps with estrogen. And of course, um, I'm guessing you already tried DIM, which is a concentrated cruciferous, which actually helps regulate estrogen. That's another factor that I would look at. Um, and um, I'm going to make a mental note because there's, I have started some, I've saw some research on this not too long ago, but I'll have to do a video on um hormonal headaches because I haven't done one on that. I think that's a really good deep dive that I'll have to further investigate to solve that uh, mystery because it's could be devastating. So especially if you probably have to take medication, well, I think the two remedies that I recommended should probably even help you just with repairing the liver from the medication. One thing that I'm, I also have attention on that um, might also help you during the headache is to take that tutka because what it can do for just the flow of things through the liver and maybe take higher amounts uh, right when you start to get the headache and see if that doesn't resolve it. So tutka is another thing to put on the list. Okay. Thank you very right. much. Well, You're welcome. Good luck with that. There's, uh, I understand migraines are no fun and I feel very blessed that that's never been one of my issues. So, um, we'd love to hear back from you, Georgina. Uh, I wonder if it's all the fungus in Baton Rouge. I was teasing her that it's so sticky and hot down there. I mean, my gosh. Um, yeah, if it was the fungus, she would have it all the time. She would have it not during the cycle. Exactly. Well, I'll quit playing doctor here. Anyway, good luck with that, Georgina. And let's go to our next to the last question, Doc, and here it is. Okay, which epigenetic factor is better to help you burn more fat, cold therapy or heat therapy. Interesting. All right, audience, jump on that. 
And let's go to Jasmine from YouTube. What can I do to treat my SIBO? I have been using your gallbladder formula as well as vitamin D and your electrolyte and cruciferous supplements. What else can Jasmine do? SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's a situation where you have bacteria in the wrong place. It's in the small intestine. It should be in the large. And, uh, and I think if I'm not mistaken, you said you're taking betaine hydrochloride because you need that for sure. And a lot of it to really keep that stomach acid you take in the bile, which is good because that'll flush out some of the bacteria too. But the next probably most important thing is to do uh, periodic prolonged fasting, more fasting to allow things to kind of go through. Um, the problem is every time you eat anything, especially fiber, uh, it'll actually end up um, fermenting at the wrong place and you feel really bloated. And those darn microbes will start stealing and robbing your nutrition. So you probably would benefit going on carnivore for one or two months. Uh, that way um, you give these microbes no fiber, no more fiber to ferment, and your digestion will be much better. All right, very good. Mumak from YouTube. Uh, is it possible that you can produce electrolytes without calcium? Does that make sense? That's a good question. I understand why. Um, in my electrolyte powder, I did not not want to put any, even though I'd never recommend taking calcium as a supplement. So I put really, really tiny amounts, right? There, if you look at the amounts, um, it's very, very small compared to what the RDAs are at least, which I think are way over the top of like, if I'm not mistaken, it could be like 750 to a, a thousand milligrams. So we're just talking about a few milligrams. So because you're taking all these electrolytes in a group or in a complex, that little bit of calcium, it's not going to be a factor, but I do understand the request. Uh, we probably won't take it completely out, uh, but I, I can look at it again, just to reevaluate. All right. Well, audience must be listening because believe it or not, the question was just was asked, which epigenetic factor is better at helping you burn more fat, cold or heat therapy in the audience as Terry designate says burr cold therapy what do you think don yeah you don't you don't uh, stimulate any brown fat you don't increase your metabolism because of that when you do heat therapy uh it's going to be the cold therapy so the cold therapy has a very specific additional benefit because they're kind of cross over they do a lot of the similar things as with recovery and brain improvement between those two therapies but that cold it's more uncomfortable. It, um, it can actually help you lose a good amount of weight. Um, so it's a really cool factor. Kind of, um, you think about what a calorie is, it has to do with heat, right? Releasing heat. Um, you're releasing a lot of heat when you do the, the cold therapy. And so um, it's a good, I think it's a great thing for weight loss. And it's also good for uh, brain health. And it's, really uncomfortable so you know it must be good for you right steve oh my gosh well you told me five seconds at first can you clue us in the audience as to how you're doing with your cold plunge oh yeah uh i i, I brought i can't do the 37 degrees uh fahrenheit i, I had to go up to 50 degrees fahrenheit and uh, that's at 10 degrees celsius and i can do that now for about five minutes wow so it's definitely getting better it's getting easier it's like the first minute and a half, all of a sudden, and then everything goes numb after that. And you're just like, okay, I can do this all day. I'll be darned. So it's, it's, um, I like it. It's a really good uh, therapy. Well, that's exciting. All right, doc, one question left. And these have been some great questions today. And here it is. Okay. Out of all the types of exercise, which specific type spikes growth hormone the most? And this would also relate to the testosterone. Oh, interesting. All right, audience, you've done so well today. Uh, carry on with that. Let's see. Oh, Sylvia Dorr from YouTube. Can you please do a live stream <laughs> with your goats? So. Um, oh, yeah, that, that's definitely doable. Yeah. I can bring them in the house and you can see them for sure. Well, I tell you what, Billy was just so adorable. My, and last time we saw Billy, he was um, just barely a handful or look about the size of a cat. I'm sure. Is Billy grown now? Is he a big guy? No, no, he hasn't really grown too much more, but uh, he's a dwarf uh, goat, but they are they're really complement the other animals because they eat all the weeds. 
they don't eat as much grass. They like the weeds and they'll eat these pricker bushes. And I'm just amazed that they, they, uh, they will eat all those things. Uh, so they're very fascinating creatures. Wow. Okay. And from YouTube after doing keto and I have for a while, uh, not in the best way. I now have been diagnosed with anemia. Isn't it, is it possible to do fasting ever again? If, if that makes sense, doc. Well, I think, um, is it an iron anemia or a B12 anemia? If you're doing the keto that I recommend, you're doing uh, red meat and you're doing, you know, fish and you're doing um, things that have B12 and iron, that should be good. But the other factor is that you need a good, strong acid stomach so that betaine hydrochloride might help you. Um, and then let's say you're, you're doing that and you still have anemia. Maybe you need to take a, a supplement like, a uh, concentrated um, spleen extract would be a really good one for anemia uh, because maybe you uh, menstruate. I don't know. Uh, so these are just things to look at to see how you can counter it. Okay, this is interesting. Black from YouTube. I'm 17 and I'm having a constant, a constant hunger feeling under my chest and near my stomach. <clears throat> this has been going on for a year. What's going on? Uh, that's interesting. Well, uh, we, the, the biggest indicator to know that keto is working and you're burning fat is your hunger goes away. So I can guarantee you that this person is not doing the low carb. They might be doing the higher carb or the frequent meals, which will make them hungry all the time and not be able to go from one meal to the next without being ravenously hungry. So uh, you need to add more fat and do less carbs and you will find that your hunger goes away. Very good. The very best audience in the world has whipped through the last question, which asked, um, out of all types of exercise, which specific type of exercise spikes the wonderful growth hormone the most? 60% say it's high intensity exercise, 20% say it's aerobic exercise, and 10% say it's weightlifting, and 10% say it's walking. So, so the high intensity in the weight training and, and is correct, but specifically, sprinting sprinting is the one i was looking for sprinting does if you do it right you actually work the whole body um and it's the highest intensity type of workout because you're you're using the whole body for this flat out sprint for what 10 seconds so um as i was revisiting this i'm like wow this is this is quite a workout this is a, a short workout too so uh steve i think you would agree anyone can at least spend 10 seconds working out, right? I mean, that's not much to ask for a person. You can actually hold your breath and do a sprint for 10 seconds. But um, I'm doing the sprinting up hills now because it's actually easier on my knees. And uh, um, But uh, the sprinting combined with the cold therapy and the heat therapy with fasting and keto is what I'm doing right now. It's like I'm doing, I'm doing a video on that, but... Um, if, if the key with sprinting is to make sure, you know, of course, do it at your own, you know, level. Don't overdo it if you have a bad joint or a knee problem. But um, it's a great, great uh, exercise. And you would just do 10 seconds and then you would wait for a while. Maybe just go back to what you're doing and then do like seven of those a day. Those flat out sprints and uh, watch what happens. You're, you'll start feeling really, really good. And it, it helps um, on many different levels because you have to, this massive explosion of all your muscles have to be coordinated. And, uh, you know, you want to wear flatter shoes. You want to, um, if you can run in the grass, that's the best. Um, so that's the exercise that can greatly help you reverse that aging process. All right, very good. This is probably our final deal for the day. And J7 Pro from YouTube, is iodine okay for someone with hypothyroid, uh, hypothyroid, say that for me. Especially, especially it's for someone with hypothyroidism because you need to build up those uh, thyroid um, hormones with iodine as a precursor. Don't forget selenium. That's for the conversion of T4 to T3. So like sea kelp has both and has zinc too. So um yeah, that's uh, you don't want to take iodine if you have hyperthyroid, but hypo is is what you want to do. All right, very good. Well, we've got a new sort of thing here. I'm going to bring in a little bumper music to remind the audience and you that we're ready to go out for the week. 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much for all your attention and your patience and uh, uh, tolerating the glitch in the system that uh, Steve promises he will completely and utterly fix next time. And it'll Absolutely. Never happen again. Um, but uh, appreciate your attention. Stay tuned for more videos and have a wonderful weekend.